Up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. Veteran BBC journalist Peter Firstbrook explores the history of the paternal side of President Obama's family in his new book, The Obamas, The Untold Story of an African Family. The award-winning documentary filmmaker goes back 20 generations and 400 years, tracing the migration of the Obama family's tribe from southern Sudan to western Kenya. He talks with the president of the King's College, Dinesh D'Souza. Peter Firstbrook, your book is called The Obamas, The Untold Story of an African Family. Now, when we think about Obama, we think of a multicultural man, mm -hmm. uh, someone of mixed race heritage, equally descended from a white mother and an African father. Um, in some senses, we might expect your book to be called The Untold Story of an American Family, but it's in The Untold Story of an African Family. Why did you choose to focus on this side of uh, the family heritage, and what is its significance? Well, when, when the American people elect a president, they, they also elect the leader of the free world. You only have to see what's happening this week in Cairo to know that the decisions making made now in the White House are going to affect the lives of 85 million Egyptians. And so I sometimes think that the American people don't fully appreciate just how big a deal it is when there's a new American president because he does have this very powerful, influential position over the rest of the world, not just the American people. And so that's the first thing, really, that he is an important man to everybody. But with Barack Obama, he is fundamentally different from any previous American president for very obvious reasons. He came up very quickly from relative obscurity, and uh, he, and Napoleon once said, give me lucky generals. I think the Democratic Party are glad they had a lucky candidate because he did come up from nowhere. He had a lot of luck. He made it to the White House, and he is mixed race. He's half black, half white, and that made him very different. I think one of the things that seems um, uh, very powerful and interesting about Obama is that there's something about him that is offshore, and by that I mean off the shores of America. When you look at previous presidents, Reagan, mm -hmm. Carter, Clinton, they are a recognizable American type. Mm -hmm. uh, you may approve or disapprove, but you can recognize them right away. Absolutely. Obama's maternal side, his mom, mm -hmm. grew up in Kansas, mm -hmm. then moved later to Seattle, mm -hmm. then to Hawaii. Uh, even she comes out of a somewhat bohemian American yes. background. But yes. you focus on his father's side, and you trace it pretty far back. I mean, uh, if I can just, I just want to read the names mm. of some of the ancestors <laughs> here. Uh, Hussein Onyango Obama, that's the grandfather. That's the grandfather. And then Opio, Obongo, Ochugo, Ogola, Onyango, Okiwiri, and Ogelo. You're going back to 1624. Um, why, this, uh, why this ancient history? Well, what, what, what's interesting there from what you said, uh, that, that you might have noticed that all the names there began with O, and actually the Luo tribe, that's the tribe from which the Obama family um, are from, they name all their males with, an, with the letter O, starting with O, and all the women have, an, have a name starting with A. And the, it's because, really, that when Obama was elected, or even when he was a candidate in, in the campaign, there were acres of newspapers print written about him. There were books, there were magazines, there were newspaper articles, there were TV programs, but they all concentrated on his life in America. And there's another whole half to Obama that I felt was really being, not being addressed, and that was his Kenyan side. And so when he was uh, elected president in, uh, in November, um, I decided that actually it'd be rather interesting to go out to Kenya to research and explore the background. And, and I actually intended to make a documentary film, that was my original idea, on the way in which his village, Kogelo, or the, rather his ancestral village, Kogelo, was going to change in the next 12, 12 months because it had been the focus of the news attention. I thought there was going to be an interesting thing there. But in fact, having done research around Kogelo and been redirected to Kindu Bay, which is where the majority of the Obamas were from, I realized actually that, that wasn't really the story to tell. The story was a remarkable transformation of a family. Go back two generations to Onyango Obama. He was born in 1895. He was essentially born into an Iron Age family. The, he, and just to clarify, Onyango yeah, Obama is the father of Barack Obama Sr., so that's it's actually so the president's grandfather. It's the 
president's paternal grandfather, Onyango. And he's a big figure in the, in the story, as you might imagine. He was born, as I say, in 1895. He was um, brought up in a society that, that hadn't had any contact with white people that didn't have the wheel, they lived in mud huts with, with, with the thatch roof, and they wore animal skins. And in two generations, you've gone from this man in 1895, uh, Onyango, to the leader of the free world living in the White House. And that is, that is a remarkable transformation to happen. Yeah, I think it's interesting how in the American political debate these things get sanitized. So Obama, for example, often will refer to his granny, which is yes. Sarah Obama. <laughs> and people don't point out that Sarah Obama is not his grandmother. No, it's one no. of his grandfather's other wives. Yes. Uh, his actual grandfather is someone, a grandmother was someone else. Yes. So there's a very uh, interesting and very tribal history. You mentioned the Luo tribe. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the two, the, the major tribes in Kenya and how did this affect the uh, milieu in which the Obama family uh, became, uh, not only was raised, but became aware politically? Well, the, uh, the Luo originated in uh, southern Sudan, and I'm going back now to around about the 1200s, so a long time ago. And um, as, as a tribe, they migrated south uh, down the White Nile into northern Uganda, and then east into western Kenya. And they arrived in western Kenya um, I suppose around about the 1500s, much the same sort of time that Columbus sailed to the New World. And they established themselves around the eastern shore of Lake Victoria. And they developed their clear identity as, as a, 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 an individual separate tribe. But of course they also displaced other tribes there because there were other tribes that were living in that part of Africa before the Luo arrived. When the tribal groups started to really form themselves, you ended up with actually over, there were over 40 different tribes in Kenya, but the dominant tribes are the Kikuyu, um, which comprise about 25% of the nation, and the Luya and then the Luo, who are about 12 or 13%. So the Luo are the third largest tribe, but actually they punch above their weight because they have a reputation for being very intelligent, uh, which they put down to a, to a high protein diet eating fish. Um, but they are primarily, they, they, they make most of the university professors and the doctors in Kenya. So they are a very influential group. But you also have the dominant tribe, which is the Kikuyu. And ever since uh, independence, uh, Kenya became independent from, from Britain in 1963. Ever since independence, there has been uh, a power struggle between the Kikuyu and the Luo f politically. And usually the Luo came off worse because the Kikuyu were the dominant tribe, they were bigger, and they had the, the very first president in, in uh, Kenya was Jomo Kenyatta, who was, a, who was a, a Kikuyu. And so there's always been this tension. Now, the, very, the, the most recent um, example of that was the, the terrible post-electoral violence that there was in, um, in Kenya uh, in 2007, early 2008, where thousands of people died, and there are still tens, hundreds of thousands of people displaced living in Red Cross tents in Kenya. So this, this tension, this struggle between the Luo and the Kenya uh, and, the, and the Kikuyu still exists today. Now, Obama's grandfather, Onyango, yes. grew up under colonialism, colonialism yes. established yes. in Kenya late in the 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, continuing to 1963 when Kenya gets independence. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, um, he has a very interesting set of interactions with the British, which uh, actually you helped me understand in your book. And, and it, you helped me understand a very uh, shocking line in Obama's own uh, book, mm -hmm. Dreams from My Father, where he says the following. He's talking to, uh, to, to Sarah Obama, and he says uh, of his grandfather, I had imagined him an independent man, a man of his people, opposed mm -hmm. to white rule. What Granny had told us scrambled that image completely, causing ugly words to flash across my mind. Uncle Tom, collaborator, mm. house nigger. So this is the President mm. of the United yeah. States using the N-word yep. to describe his own grandfather. Yes. Uh, what's going on here? Well, I mean, first of all, I think you have to, you have to put Dreams from My Father in context. It was, it was first published in 1995, and it was written when uh, President Obama was, I guess, 33. Now, 
certainly if I'd written a memoir when I was 33, there'd be certain things that I'd <laughs> regretted writing now, and, and I suspect it might be true for you as well. And so you know, what he wrote then um, may not necessarily be what he, what he believes now. Although conversely, when you're a political man, you Poss may wish you didn't say it, but you might have actually <laughs> Well, I, I don't know of anybody, any major political figure who's actually uh, had the audacity to write a memoir at that age and then have to live with it. And I think actually it's to, to Barack Obama's credit that he's actually gone public, as it were, at a very young age and, and has had to live with this. And this and book was a kind of campaign document for him, distributed uh, and, uh, well, I mean, it was widely discussed during the camp yes. in 84, and, I mean, 2004, yeah. when he gave the Democratic I Convention think, I mean, speech. I think Audacity of Hope was probably a, a, a clearer campaign document than um, That's very true. Dreams from, and, and, and in 1995, when uh, uh, Pre President Obama wrote that, I'm not sure he had the sort of political ambitions that he had later on uh, by... That's right. Time Come back to Onyango. Tell yes, us I have what, answered your, what, answered it your is, question. what was it about Onyango Obama yeah. that uh, would, would make his grandson uh, yeah. have these suspicions about him? Was, was it that he... Did he it was it his relationship with the British? Is that what? Um, I think it was. I mean, one of the one of the biggest surprises to me when I got, I got stuck in and researched this was actually how much I learned about Onyango, and I found him an absolutely fascinating man, a difficult man. People people would tell me, and these were his friends that and relatives. He was a very harsh man, was the word that they'd use. But Onyango was very smart. He was very intelligent, and he realised at a very early stage that actually the British were successful in Kenya because they were able to work together. And whereas he saw the African as actually not, not being organized and therefore, therefore weaker. And he had no choice but to live under, under British rule and he made the best of it. He, he grew quite wealthy as a, as a house boy, a house, house servant. And he did, he was an Anglophile. I mean, he did respect the British. But he was, he was his own master as well. And I'm not sure that that really came out in Dreams from My Father because um, the one thing that he would never ever do is allow himself to be beaten by his by his white Kenyan master, and that was a very common occurrence between the wars, between the first and second war in Kenya. It was nothing to to beat your house servant. Onyango wouldn't stand f for it, and on one occasion he actually took the cane off his off his boss and and turned around and and hit him with it, and he was arrested and and then released because actually the magistrate said that that was is fair fair comment and, and a protection. So although. Onyango did live with the British under British rule and prosper from it. I think he was also his own man. Yes, he seems to be fiercely independent. Yes. Certainly not someone to put up with any kind of nonsense from anyone, <laughs> including his, uh, his wives uh, or his, uh, his son. Yeah. On the other hand, he does raise a politically incorrect question because he, he asks the question, how did we, the Africans, get into the situation? Mm -hmm. How did the white man, and particularly mm -hmm. Britain, a tiny island, yeah. uh, uh, control uh, one third or one half of the real estate on the planet? It's got to be something to do with technology and power and organizational skills yeah. and commercial and military strength. So in some senses, he was saying that the African is not up to snuff as of right now. Uh, and, uh, and it seems like this this is what, this was the heresy, if you will, that Obama's, that rankled Obama, this yes. sort of idea that there might have been something uh, successful about colonialism from which even the colonized can learn. And I think that's probably true. I mean, I, the British colonization is a, is a really prickly question. Um, it's not a matter of whether, in fact, the British were good or bad, or whether it's a good thing or, or not. In the late 19th century, it was inevitable. You know, somebody or other was going to colonize that part of Africa, as indeed they colonized India and, and large parts of the, of the Far East. And so you had, from the 1880s, this scramble for Africa when you had the Europeans get together a large table in Berlin and literally sat down and carved up the continent in a extraordinary arrogant way and it happened that that Britain because it had a powerful navy and uh, was actually um, sending sending ships out to India it, it had a control over the Indian Ocean which allowed them uh, to establish themselves in the late eight, uh, 19th century in Kenya but actually the, the, the British weren't that interested in Kenya in the early early years it didn't have a lot of uh, mineral resources and it had very very poor communication in land. What you have to remember is if you've got a, a huge continent like Africa and no roads, no railways and no aeroplanes, the only way into the continent is actually in, in, in rivers. And Kenya never had the sort of big rivers like 
the Congo and the Zambezi and so on, to give steamships access into the interior. And so Kenya was really left to the, to the, to the very end, to the late 19th century, before the British really got, got involved at all in developing it. But then, of course, there was the power struggle with the other colonial nations, and Germany was on the rise, and Russia, Imperial Russia was on the rise, and therefore, I guess the British felt they had to consolidate their power. The, the, the other important thing is that um, the, uh, the Suez Canal had been built uh, towards the end of the 19th century, and the, the British were completely fixated about somehow controlling the headwaters of the Nile, and thereby controlling their interests in Egypt, which is very important to them at the time, and, and the access to the, to the Red Sea. And so it, the British got interested in Kenya really quite late in the day, and not for the sort of reasons that you'd normally expect them to colonize a large tract of land in Africa. Let's talk, if we may, about Barack Obama Sr., mm. which is Obama's dad. Mm -hmm. Now, he was born, of course, under colonialism. Yes. Uh, but he came of age at the time when Kenya became free. He yes. came to the United States, 1959, I believe, shortly yep. before uh, Kenyan independence. Mm -hmm. um, now, he was a strange man, as you as you describe. Uh, <laughs> he he was he had four wives. Yes. Uh, he had at least eight known children. Yes. Didn't seem to, if I can say fairly, look after any one of them. Um, he was a chronic alcoholic, mm -hmm. got into multiple drunk driving accidents, mm -hmm. killed a man at one occasion. Yes. Um, and um, uh, now, and yet, this strange man, a polygamist, uh, an alcoholic, a failure who would sit outside his hut, according to his sister, or rail and rant and foam at the mouth, this is the very man of whom the president writes, dreams from my father. His autobiography, at least of his early years, yes. is this is the man that had a tremendous impact on him. And my question is, what is it about Barack Obama Sr.? You, you wouldn't think that this would be a role model. What is it about this man that's had such an impact on President Obama? Well, I, I'm familiar with, with some of the things that you've written about um, President Obama's rage, the roots of, of Obama's rage. And I'm not even sure that his father had that much influence on him because what you didn't address in Obama's life was the influence of his mother. Now, in, in his um, 2004 introduction, when his Dreams from My Father was, was reissued, he did say, first of all, that you need to look at this book in, in the context of the time then. Now, that may be that he then got political ambitions and maybe he was wriggling out of it a little bit. But nevertheless, he, um, he did say that maybe, because his mother was dying at the time um, when, when the book was originally published, and he did look back and think, well, maybe he wrote the wrong book, that in fact it shouldn't have been a meditation on an absent father, but more it should have been a celebration of the, of the, the, the one consistent person in his life that was his mother. Now, his, his mother was, was um, as you said, Bohemian. It was the mid '60s when she married a second time and went out to Indonesia. Um, she m was probably a bit of a hippie, I guess. And uh, I think actually it's his mother that had a bigger influence on him than his father. Well, we agree on this, but but this is what this is what I think about it. And yeah. I, I want to focus on your sure. book, not mine. But um, see, I think what happened with his mother was that she was um, a Bohemian. She rebelled, as many young Americans do, against her parents a little bit, against mm -hmm. her country a little bit. She wanted to marry a bit of a third world mm -hmm. anti-American guy, and she mm -hmm. found one in Hawaii, Barack mm -hmm. Sr. And guess what's interesting? When he dumped her, and, yes. which he did, going on to Harvard, yep. uh, she married another third world anti-American yes. guy, Lolo Satoro, yes. an Indonesian. Um, and uh, she took uh, young Obama to Indonesia. Yes. Uh, ironically, Lolo Satoro in Indonesia becomes more pro-Western, more pro-American. This yes. is by Obama's own account. And his mother became very antagonistic. And she would attack him and say to young Barack, don't be like this guy. Be like your real dad. He was a real man. He was uncompromising. He had ideals. So here's my point. Right. I do think his, Ob his mother had enormous influence on him. Yes. She was his father's first convert. And so she was the one who elevated in young Obama's yes. mind this mythic, larger-than-life image of the father. And then as Obama grew older, it was a shock for him to realize 
gee, my father's not quite this uh, romantic sort of Gandhi of Kenya. He yes. was actually a very flawed man. And that's when Obama yes. undertakes his journey to Africa yes. to find out for himself the great scene you write about, about Obama at the family grave, mm. weeping, and so on. Let's talk a little bit more though about, about uh, Barack Obama Sr.'s yeah. world. Um, he came to America in 1959. Yes. Um, he went to Hawaii. Um, what uh, you, you refer to a 1965 essay that he wrote, yes, uh, in which uh, problems facing our socialism, and yes. he called himself an African uh, socialist. Do you think you, you you describe that essay in the context of debates within Kenya? Yes, and, and it was. Yes. Uh, in fact, when we think of anti-colonialism, we forget there are, there are different species of anti-colonialism. Yes. There was Jomo Kenyatta, yeah. who was more pro-Western, more pro-free market. There was Tom Maboya, who's Obama's father's mentor. Yes. Uh, he was more on the left, and then on the far left, yes. Odinga, yes. Uh, who was basically pro-Soviet, and and and, and, and uh, yes. so you've got these species of anti-colonialism. Talk a little bit about that. That landscape, because I think it's fascinating. People often think of anti-colonialism as one thing, yes. but it's actually uh, has ha, it's a man. It has many different colors. Well, it was a, it was actually a very exciting time in Kenya because they had at long last got their independence from the British in 1963, and all the students in in American University were all pouring back into Nairobi, you know, to get the jobs in government, and most of which were being vacated by the, the British who were going going home, and so. It was, it was a very exciting time in which the government were trying to find out really what sort of political system was going to best suit their, their country. But you, you refer to them all as, as anti-colonial. And actually, I think they were, they were post-anti-colonial by that time. They'd actually got their country back from the British. The British had actually left Kenya in a pretty good state. It had got a, you know, a major railway. It had got a good road system, airports, telegraph, telephones. So compared to the state that some of the other African countries were left by the European colonial powers, Kenya was in a pretty good shape. And so the Kenyans had, had, had got what they wanted after, after I, I admit, a prolonged and rather nasty struggle during the Mamau years. So these people were debating about what it was they wanted. And so I don't actually think that Obama Sr. was anti-colonial at this stage. He was an angry man. He did have rage, and he did drink himself into, into alcoholism. But I think that his anger was not directed at the British. I think he was directed at, at the other Kenyan politicians because you had Jomo Kenyatta, the first president who came to power in 1963, who, as you rightly say, was, was advocating a, a mixed economy. But I think actually that was a, more of a cover for, because what Kenyatta went on to do was that he played the tribalism card. He indulged in nepotism. He allowed corruption to become endemic in Kenya, as it still is today. And he eventually moved the government to a single party state in which he couldn't be elected out of office. And I think that, that Obama Sr.'s anger was actually more directed at what was going on within his own country than at what the British had done and uh, having left their, their own country. And, so, and, and the other thing is that, that there's no doubt that, I mean, even his best friends will tell you this, Obama Sr. was a very arrogant man. And he had a very high opinion of himself. He was very clever, but he was, he was arrogant. And the other thing that he did was that he would, um, he would rail against his, his superiors, his bosses, and they didn't like that. And he would often quite publicly denounce, in some, on one occasion, the head of the, the Central Bank of Kenya, as, and he said, I'm the, real, I'm the real clever man around here. And that didn't go down very well with the senior people in government and, and, and the, the major departments. And so Obama Sr.'s fall from grace was, I don't think, anything to do with anti-colonialism. I think it was to do with watching his country decline and also in, in, in him decline as, as well, and him not getting the due credit that he really felt he deserved. No, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, he was a he was a pompous man. He and, was. Uh, I think uh, uh, you mentioned that when he uh, was at Harvard, he would call himself Dr. Obama, even though he, he did he not have a doctorate. A, he never did get a PhD. Uh, he got a master's degree, but yeah. he never made it to a doctorate, I'm afraid. Um, and um, so, yes, you've got this post-colonial world, um, but you know, I think you would agree, I, you know, uh, you're from Britain, I grew up in India, yeah. that the 50 years or so after colonialism, anti-colonialism remained the dominant political trajectory. Everything mm. was seen through the lens of colonialism. Yes. 
the Indian independence leaders were educated in Britain. Yes. Uh, they were advocating yeah. Fabian socialism yeah. and various species of ideas that were yeah. often the last export of colonialism yes. itself. Yes. Um, you mentioned the Mau Mau revolt, and I, yeah. I, I'd like to say, uh, have you say a word about this for this reason. It seems to me there have been people, when you think of uh, where, where people get their ideas, uh, you often think you get your ideas in college or in the faculty mm -hmm. lounge. But for those of us who've grown up in the third world and other countries, you often find powerful historical events and sometimes very bloody, mm -hmm. which a lot of people get killed. So these anti-colonial wars were not uh, hypothetical uh, mm -hmm. wars. They were mm -hmm. real wars. Mm -hmm. Many people died. Now, in India, there was a revolt in the 1850s, the mm -hmm. Sepoy, Sepoy revolt yes. with the soldiers. The British came in. A lot of people were arrested, were shot. But, and my grandfather remembered all that, but that was... Really? Uh, that was that was still 150 years ago. Yeah. My grandfather was born in 1899. Um, and, uh, but my point is that in Kenya, the anti-colonial revolt was in the 1950s. Mm. Uh, and Obama was born in 1961, yes. so it was right in Obama's lifetime. It affected his grandfather and his brother and his, and his father. Uh, yes. So talk a little bit about the Mau Mau revolt right. and what significance it might have had for the Obama family. Well, uh, the, the Obama revolt was really one of the really dark sides, I think, of British colonial history. Um, you mean the Mau Mau revolt? I beg your pardon. These are the Obama oh, revolt. I'm so That's sorry. Okay. You meant the Mau Mau. Yeah. Mau Mau revolt. The Kenyan soldiers were drafted into the King's African Rifles during the, during the Second World War, and they, they fought and died in, in Burma and in India. And when they came back, they'd, they'd been told that they were fighting for freedom and democracy, and they got back, and they found actually in Kenya nothing had changed. There's no freedom, and there's no democracy from them. And out of the roots of that, of that frustration after the Second World War grew, grew the, the Mau Mau Revolt, which um, ended up as a, a very bloody, very nasty, um, revolt not only against the white Kenyans, but what I think a lot of people who, who maybe haven't looked at the Mau Mau period in any great detail, it was actually a civil war within, within the Africans themselves. Many, many, many more people, uh, black Kenyans, died during Mau Mau than ever were massacred by the white. I mean, I grew up in the 1950s in, in Britain, and you know, I can still hear the echo of the Pathé news reels of the Mau Mau and how these black savages were, were massacring the whites in, in uh, the machetes. Kenya. Absolutely, and, and that this did happen. Yeah. But you're talking about you know a few score, I, I don't want to diminish the seriousness of it, but you're talking about a few score white people, whereas there were literally tens of thousands of black Kenyans killed by, by, by Kenyans. And so this, this uprising um, was, was very shocking, even more so for the, for the black Kenyans than the white Kenyans. But the British response to this was to res suppress it violently, and they had internment camps, and literally tens of thousands of um, so-called Mau Mau sympathizers um, went through internment camps. They subjected them to the most appalling, brutal torture. A lot of people died, uh, disappeared, and, and there have been some, some rather grandiose estimates of the number of people. And some, I think, um, Karen, um, the, Karen Elkins. Yeah, Elkins. Um, I mean, she estimated, I, I don't know, 250,000, 300,000 people. I, I, I think the figure is probably closer to somewhere like 70 or 80,000. But that's an awful lot of people in a population of maybe 15 or 20 million at the time. And, and one of the men, uh, you say, in custody for six months, or more than six months, um, uh, no, probably interrogated, yes. uh, arg um, allegedly tortured, was one Onyango Obama. Yes, the grandfather of the president. Uh, that was a, it's a very strange story, that, because what everybody seems to have agreed on is it happened in 1949. Now, that was at the very beginning of the Mau Mau insurrection. Um, certainly the British were desperate for any information because they really didn't understand what was going on in, in the early years in 1949. But the, the insurrection really didn't get going until 50 to about 55 with the really bloody years. And yet here we have Onyango, who was generally recognized as, a, as an Anglophile. He, liked, he generally liked the British. They liked him. He respected him. And he was arrested, according to Sarah Obama, his, his fifth wife. That's, that's Granny Sarah to the president, his step-grandmother. I talked to her about it. I mean, I, the, the news of that particular episode broke in the Times of London, um, actually when I was out there doing my research. And so I was familiar with the story, both from the Times and also having spoken to Sarah. And it is a, it is a complicated thing. I think what actually happened was, that, um, I don't think Onyango was a, um, 
a sympathizer. Was a I, I don't think he was yeah. a collaborator at all with Mao Mao. I think he had too much respect for the British. I, I, I have no absolute evidence for this, but, but Onyango was a difficult man, and he had run-ins with a number of local chiefs who themselves were, were used by the British to control the local population. And he had a number of run-ins with um, uh, a local chief called uh, uh, Maboya. It's not, not related to Tom Maboya. Um, and he was f fingered by somebody, by, by an African, according to, to uh, Sarah Obama, although she didn't ever specify who, who it was. And I think that it's, it's every chance that um, he was arrested actually to settle old scores rather than anything to do with his involvement in, with Mama. The other thing is that you have to remember that the, the Mama insurrection was primarily a Kikuyu insurrection. Exactly. It was the Kikuyu who had all their land taken away from them in the White Highlands, the area north of Nairobi. They were the people who were deeply resentful and suffered most uh, from, the, from the, the land grab that happened in the early 20th century. The Luo, Luo didn't, and in many ways the Luo were actually used by the British as, as wardens, as, as, as um, askaris, as soldiers, to control. So th the British actually very effectively uh, controlled the, the Kenyan population by playing off the Luo against the Kikuyu. They'd used, as there was no lo love lost between the two of them, the, the British tend to use the Luo a lot as askaris. And so um, in the end, there were, there were certainly Luo people involved in the Mau Mau insurrection, but then their numbers were very small. So he might have been framed or set up in some way, or someone someone basically falsely accused him. Let me ask you this: yeah. He comes home, he's he's uh, scarred. He's uh, Sarah Obama says he he essentially became an old man yes. during yes. his captivity. Now, I want your opinion on a, on a sort of interesting hypothesis here, okay. uh, one that I think actually brings all of this to light. Mm -hmm. When President Obama came in as, uh, into the White House, uh, he noticed that in the in the Oval Office there was mm -hmm. a bust, a statue of Winston yeah. Churchill. It was reported both in Britain and in America that this annoyed Obama and he wanted the bust returned. Yes. Uh, the British, a little chagrined because of a long-time special relationship, yes. said uh, to Obama, uh, don't give it back to us, uh, put it yes. somewhere else. Mm. Uh, but Obama was sort of weirdly insistent, and the yes. bust today is in the home of the British ambassador uh, to the, in, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. so it's in a sense on British soil. Now, for many Americans, Republican, Democrat, the normal theories of understanding Obama can't make sense of this. You know, Obama's a progressive, he's a leftist, even if he's a socialist, so what? Why do this? Now, interestingly, uh, um, it was Winston Churchill, as yes. you know, who was the Prime Minister of Britain, yes. re-elected after World War II in the 50s, yes. uh, who directed uh, British special troops to go to Kenya, yep. basically lock up every able-bodied yes. male, uh, and, and not only was uh, Barack Obama senior at one point uh, jailed, mm -hmm. uh, but Onyango uh, allegedly yes. tortured. So here's my point. Is it possible that this Churchill episode, otherwise inexplicable, can, yes. can be understood by looking at this family history that you so thoroughly document uh, yes. in this book. What, what you didn't mention, I think, that uh, President Obama replaced the statue of Churchill with that of Abraham Lincoln, and who yeah. was his, his great hero. And you know, to me, it's entirely uh, understandable that an American president should want the, the bust of a, of a, a great oh, American yeah. president. So, the issue so, wasn't the no, bust, the issue was I, I sending it back. Yes, yes. I don't understand it. I mean, it, it hit, hit the news in Britain um, for a while, and the tabloids were, were very upset about it in the end. I think the Brits sort of shrug this thing off. It, 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 it is not easy. I don't want to be an apologist for, for President Obama. I don't fully understand it. But you do have to remember also that Winston Churchill was, was a great wartime leader. There's no doubt about that. I mean, had it not been for him being prime minister during the Second World War, who knows what would have happened. So there's no doubt that, that of all the people of the 20th century, Winston Churchill probably is recognized as the greatest British leader of all time. But, but there are parts of his political career which actually um, do not stand up to, to scrutiny. And certainly he was, as you say, he was prime minister, he was a very senior member of the government during the, the, the Mau Mau. And who knows, I, you know, President Obama is a student of history, he understands that. I'm not sure that I would want the bust of a man that was responsible for killing or 70, 80, or allowing 70 or 80,000 uh, members of the, of the uh, 
the nation of my father staring at me across the Oval Office. I'm Agreed. Like, in know. fact, when I was growing up in India, uh, you know, we didn't know so much the World War II Churchill. We learned about the Churchill who met Gandhi and then said, I will not be the uh, Queen's first minister to preside over the liquidation yes. of the British Empire. Yes. So I'm not defending Churchill yes. here. I'm simply yeah. saying that it seems to me this has explanatory power. Yes. You know, and, and we know that Obama knows this colonial history. Here he is in Africa. I'm now reading from his book. And he comes across a street sign with, uh, which is named after Kamathi. Yes. Well, Kamathi was one of the hoodlums, if you will, who was one of the leaders yeah. of the Mau Mau revolt. Yeah, he was. Uh, and one of the, uh, g basically his capture and shooting ended the revolt. Yes. So Obama knows this history extremely well. Yes. He makes, he, he, he and, and I think this, I think for many Americans is a bit of a surprise. When we think about Obama, we think about African American, descended yes. from slaves, segregated lunch counters, Martin Luther King, uh, the migration to Chicago. There's none of this in your book. You get a sense of with Obama that while he is African-American in yes. the technical sense, yes. he's descended yes. from a black man yes. and a white woman, his own history is not multicultural. It's, it's monocultural. Yes. It comes out of a very specific history of a specific country going through a specific uh, set of, of challenges. How yes. does that equip an Obama, growing up in America to be sure and educated here, to face this completely different world? I mean, you've got pictures in your book. Uh, and they're only from a generation ago. Mm. And as you say, this is, the, this, is not, this is the Iron Age. It's not the Stone Age, but it's not yeah. far removed. Yeah. Uh, it's a picture of huts. Yes. Uh, it's a picture of beads, uh, witch doctors, medicine men, uh, no cars. Mm. Uh, and, and yet from that to now the highly competitive globalized world, how ready, in your view, is an Obama for this new world? Or does his background equip him? For that work. Well, you have to you have to remember when he first went when he first went to Kenya. He was 26 years old. He was a university student, um, and then when, as I said, when he wrote um, the Dreams for My Father, he was only only 33. And I think that his his trip out to Kenya clearly was had a very very profound effect on them. There's no doubt about that. Um, I would say good thing too. I think that you know, American presidents should travel more, and I th as I think British prime ministers should travel more. I think the more you get out and see the rest of the world, the real world, the more you understand. And so I think actually this does equip President Obama very well because we are living in a globalized world. We are, as I say, what what's decisions being made in the White House this week are going to affect the lives of 85 million Kenyans. And, you know, we, it's beholden on him to make the best decision possible, not only for the American people, but also for the Egyptian people as well, and for the rest of the world, because if he gets it wrong, then things could go very, very badly wrong in the Middle East. And so I think the very fact that uh, President Obama did spend the best part of four years in Indonesia as a, as a young boy, he traveled to Kenya um, as a young student, I think these are all positive things to actually help him understand that there is something more beyond the boundaries of, of, of the USA and that uh, there is a big world with a lot of people living out there that are affected by your decisions. It gives them more global perspective. I think so, yes. I think so. Uh, Peter, first we're talking about your book, The Obamas, The Untold Story of an African Family. We've been looking at Obama's, President Obama's lineage through his father's side mm -hmm. um, in Africa, in Kenya. Um, let's put one thing to rest. You're not a birther. In other words, we're not discussing where, whether Obama was born in Hawaii yeah. or born in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, you think he was born quite clearly in Hawaii. Now, let's, let's because there are people who, who cling to yeah. this. There are birth certificates of all kinds mm. uh, circulating yeah. on the Internet. This is an, a kind of an issue that doesn't seem to go away. Um, yes. And my, So let's, let's try to put it to rest a little bit. Why do you say that, why are you confident that Obama was born in, in Hawaii? Well, it's, 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 it's never really been an issue in Britain. I mean, basically, we can let anybody become prime minister, and it's not a, not a big deal. You don't have to be native-born. You don't native have born. to be native-born. I, but I understand that constitutionally that you have to be born in, on American territory to become president. And so that's why it's a big thing over here. And so I thought, well, you know, let's, let's really have a close look at this and examine what the argument of the birthers is. Now, the first thing is that they said he wasn't born in Hawaii. And yet the, um, the Department of Health has published a certificate of live birth that's on the Internet. Anybody can access it. And I, I think you can even get copies now. I was reading 
recently, I think last week, that for $100 you can get your own copy of this from Hawaii. The, uh, the director of the health department in, in Hawaii is, has gone on record as saying there is, this is perfectly legitimate, there's nothing unusual about this. And I believe even there were references to the birth of, of the, the, um, uh, President Obama in, in, the, in the local papers in, in sure, Honolulu. Sure, the Honolulu Sunday so, advertiser, I think, yeah, had a so notice. I'm, and yet, as you say, this won't go away. And so the, one of the main arguments of the birth is he was born in Mombasa. So I thought, well, okay, let's really test that premise. 1961, just before, before he was born, um, Obama Sr. was a poor student. His wife um, was a, had been an a, a undergraduate. Her parents were not rich. They had absolutely no money. I mean, we know that Obama Sr. didn't have any money because he couldn't afford to take his wife to um, Harvard. He was offered, when he left Hawaii, he was offered uh, two scholarships, and he opted for Harvard, which actually was the, the poorer paid one, right. and couldn't, so they had no money. To fly from Hawaii to, to Kenya is literally halfway around the world, and in those days you'd have had, a, I don't know, probably six or eight stopovers. Even getting from London to Nairobi, you stopped off at, in, in, in Italy and in Egypt, and so there's a huge help. They didn't have the money to go to Kenya. The second question is, why would they go to Kenya? Obama at the time had not told Anne that he was already married, let alone with two children in Kenya. He was also illegally married in Hawaii because he hadn't divorced Kezia, his first wife. He was a bigamist, and it actually his his marriage to Anne was null and void legal. It was not legal because he was a, he was a bigamist. So it begs the question, not why? Not to mention that his father, Onyango Obama, disapproved of I, this union. Actually, well, both, both fathers, um, both Anne's father and Onyango, and Onyango wrote and, and threatened to disinherit his son if he went ahead of this, with this. And so it then begs the question, why would Obama Sr. take his heavily pregnant wife to Kenya to meet his family and his first wife and his first t two children? That makes a complete nonsense of it. The third element is, here you have people saying, and I, I, I do not understand, people that were claiming that he was born in Mombasa. Now, Mombasa is on the coast, on the Indian, Indian, on the Indian Ocean, Ocean, as far away across Kenya as you can possibly get, 500 miles. It would take two days on the train to get from Kindu Bay, Kisumu, get from the Lake Victoria, all the way across. Why would they travel all that way to a part of Kenya where you have a different tribe, you have a different tribal language, where they didn't know anybody. If, if Anne was going to have her baby in Kenya, it would be with um, Obama Sr.'s relatives all around and that sort of support structure. They would never have gone to Mombasa. The birth has claimed, ah, but the reason why she's on M Mombasa is she's flying home to Hawaii and she was very heavily pregnant at the time and the airline wouldn't allow her onto the aircraft. Well, in 1961, there was an airport in Mombasa, but it was a military base used by the British, and there wasn't a commercial flight out of Mombasa until back into the 70s. The only way in and out of Kenya in those days by air, by commercial air, was actually through Nairobi. So n none of this makes any sense at all. Right, I know. I think, I think you're right about that. Let me ask you this. The, um, when Barack Obama Sr. came to America... Um, he, um, he came as a student to Hawaii. Now, the president, Barack Obama, as part of his campaign and to rally the black vote, and the landscape of this, of course, is that uh, there was a black poet in America who called Bill Clinton America's first yeah. black president. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Hillary Clinton yeah. had a lot of that Clinton affinity with mm -hmm. the black community. It was very important for Obama politically mm -hmm to essentially wrest that from Hillary uh, and be, mm. if you will, the African-American candidate mm. for president. Mm. So he goes to Selma, Alabama, yes. and he says, I'm coming home to Selma, and he's got to make a connection. Here is you know, Obama uh, raised uh, in, as you say, a different part of the world. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, but he's got to Americanize himself. He's got to he's got to make a connection between the civil rights movement and his history. And so he says that the Kennedys sponsored an airlift, mm -hmm. uh, and this was part of the civil rights idealism. And gee, one Barack Obama senior came on the airlift, met my mom. That's why I'm here. So he's able to directly credit. Uh, if you will, the Martin Luther King movement for his very existence yes. and also his political uh, success. Uh, now, all of this turns out to be a little bit of a fable. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is that the Kennedy airlift had nothing to do with mm -hmm. Barack Obama mm -hmm. senior coming. Kennedy was elected in 1960. Yes. Barack Obama senior comes in 1959. Yes. There was an airlift, but he wasn't on it. That's right. Um, in fact, you point out and you document very, uh, I think, uh, interestingly that Obama Sr. was much more entrepreneurial in figuring out how to get here. And it had yes. nothing to do with some big government subsidized airlift. Yeah. How did he get here? Well, um, as you say, um, he, he came independently. I mean, even though he was actually a, a good friend of Tom Boyer, who worked, did organize the airlift, um, he didn't get on it. Uh, but he did befriend. Um, a couple of American women who were, um, I think, the wives of people working in the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi at the time. And, and there's no doubt that for all his, his faults, Obama Sr. was a very, very charming man, and he could charm the ladies. And he, he clearly impressed these, these women, not only with his ambition and his determination, but his intelligence. And so it was actually through private means that he was able to secure a place in Hawaii and uh, he actually fl flew quite independently of, of Maboy's airlift to Hawaii with women uh, from American women in Nairobi uh, Embassy who had actually f funded his, um, his place uh, and his airfare. You, you, you talked about the Selma speech, and uh, you know, President Obama is a consummate politician, and he, he gave this great speech, rousing speech in Selma, in which he referred to the fact that this farmer came over on this great airlift, and he also used it to somehow claim part of the Camelot connection with the Kennedys. And you're right that actually that uh, Kennedy wasn't elected until the following year. But I, I will say that his, his, he made an error, and he acknowledged the error immediately. His campaign team actually made public just a few days after Selma, that actually that was an error right. and that, in fact, it wasn't correct. So he, he did correct himself, even though he was, I guess, hoping to use the airlift and the, and the Kennedy connection uh, in his favor. But he, he, he did at least correct he himself. He acknowledged the yes, error. Yes, he did. One, I think, to me, one striking thing is you, in a very detailed way, and I think you've got a lot of original research in this book. Mm. You've talked to mm. people. You've spent a lot. Let's talk for a moment about yeah. your research methodology. You didn't just read a bunch of books. You went to Kenya. Uh. Uh, you <laughs> talked to a lot of people close to Obama. Tell us who you talked to, and, 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 and by the way, how did you speak to people who don't speak English? Well, I, I also read a lot of books as well, but I mean, the, yes, you're right. The primary research actually came from, from flogging it around Kenya and spending weeks and weeks and weeks out there. I went out five times over the course of about a year. I, I, and I did find that after four or five weeks, really, I had to come home because it's not easy working in, in, in Africa. It's hot, it's dusty, nothing really works properly. Uh, you're traveling very long distances in, in appalling road conditions. And you just need to, to, to back off and, and um, get some perspective. So I'd go out for four or five weeks at a time, come back for a week, and then, then, then go out. And, and really what I did was I just went around and spoke to everybody I possibly could. Now, quite a lot of people did speak English. The, the, the educated, older generation did. But, but the majority of people actually spoke um, Swahili and the Luo, which is the, the tribal language of the Luo. And there were some people I met um, who, who didn't even sweep, speak Swahili, which is, which is the other language, in, 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 uh, universal national language in Kenya. And so I had to work with, um, with a translator and a researcher. And probably the luckiest thing that ever happened was I met uh, a young local councillor called Roy Samo who was a Luo in, in Kisumu on my, first, on my first visit. And Roy just seemed to know everybody. Uh, he spoke very good English. He spoke to Luo. He spoke Swahili. Um, he he's, he's sort of ran a, an ad hoc travel agency. It wasn't very successful. Um, but nevertheless, he had access to vehicles. And, and Roy was absolutely terrific. And, and the, the two of us went around large parts of Kenya driving for hours and hours on end, tracking these people down. It is a lot easier now to do this than it was because people do have mobile phones. 
um, but they don't all switch them on, so that you, you can't always get the people that you want. And, and most of the time, I, I, would, I would get a lead, and I would just go and have to find these people. We'd stop and ask, and we'd be directed on, and we'd turn to some, up in somebody's compound, completely out of the blue, um, with this this mzungu, this white this white man suddenly saying, "Well, you know, you are you are uh, President Obama's grandmother's brother. You know, can I can I talk to you about this?" And I I just found universally people were very open, they were very friendly, they just loved to sit down, and I would spend hours and hours sitting on, under the shade of, of trees talking to these people and gradually and that what they gave me were the jigsaw puzzle pieces which I then had to join together and of course you know with a journalist background you've got to double check your sources and get independent correlation and, and collaboration of, of, of what you found and, and there were a lot of things I, I, I was told that that aren't in the book because I just couldn't make them I mean, exciting stuff but I just couldn't make them stand up and so they weren't for publication the uh, I think one of the things uh, striking about some of your conversations with people who knew Barack Obama mm. Sr. Mm. is that uh, to the end of his life, they uh, keep referring to him as Barry. Yes. Now, uh, I say this because it, it, to an ordinary American reader, uh, it's a little jarring, and here's why. We think of Barack Obama, the president, mm -hmm. as born Barry. Mm -hmm. The Newsweek, uh, I think, did a cover story, uh, How Barry Became Barack. And it's kind of a pivotal moment in Obama's own development uh, and his own uh, racial mm. uh, identity mm. in which he decides to change his name uh, yes. and go from Barry to Barack. Mm -hmm. And the general assumption is that uh, President Obama was taking his father's name. His father was Barack. Here was young American <laughs> Barry in Hawaii yeah. who took his African name and became Barack. But that's not true. In reality, the father was also Barry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the father came to America. He was Barry Obama. He remained Barry in, in Kenya. And so the significance of this to me is that it's not that President Obama uh, gave up his birth name to take his father's name. But in some senses, you might say, he rejected his father's American name, mm. the Barry, to take his African name Barack. So, in other words, uh, in other words, I'm wondering if the significance of it is not, I want to identify more with my dad, but I want to reject a certain aspect of my father, the Barry, mm. and go for the, you may say, African identity, yes. the Barack. Uh, is do, do you what do you what do you make of all this? Well, I think you can read too much into it. I mean, there's no doubt that his father was called Barry. And in fact, you talk to his old friends, the men in their 70s and 80s, and I spent a lot of time sitting in bars pouring uh, Johnny Walker Black Label into them to get them to... Uh, Obama's <laughs> own favorite His, his uh, own beverage. favorite, absolutely. Yes. We, we, we would joke about Mr. Double Double. He was called Double Double because he'd buy, he'd buy two double whiskeys at a time. And it was an indication, I think, of his heavy drinking. And um, we did have a lot of time. And they always referred to him. They never referred to him as Barack. They always referred to him as Barry. And uh, Barry did this and Barry did that. But I do think that there's a danger of reading too much, too much significance into this because um, President Obama changed his name from Barry. I mean, he had no choice. He had no option about being called Barry. That's what he was called in Hawaii by his mother and by his grandparents and by his, his school children. Um, and I think you're talking now about the president. I'm sorry, uh, I'm talking about the president pre now. Yes. yes. Okay. So he was he was originally called Barry. He he didn't adopt that name. Um, he was just given it. And I right. think when he became a young man. And he was trying to find his own identity. Um, he opted for Barack. Who knows why? You think it uh, has some sort of political undertone. I would say that maybe it's because it's more distinctive. It's a bit more mysterious. Maybe it worked better for him with the girls. And and you know you, you have to also remember that his mother changed her name as well because she was called Stanley up until she became a, a teenager, went to university, and and was in a position to actually change her name. And she reverted to her second name Anne, which actually was. A, makes a lot of sense for her too. Yeah. I don't know. You, you can make a lot out of uh, President Obama changing his name from Barry to Barack. That's what he was christened. And all he's doing is adopting the name that his parents gave him. You explore in the book um, that um, while Obama's father, um, actually his grandfather, converted to Islam yes. and then took the name Hussein, mm -hmm. um, that 
in fact, Obama Sr., Barack's, uh, pre the president's father, and I think this is also true of his stepfather, by the way, Lolo Satoru, yes. later in Indonesia, um, they were born Muslim, mm -hmm. but they were really atheists. And yes. Obama's mom, we know, Obama says himself, atheist. was also yes, an atheist. Yes. So it, it's interesting because there's a lot of speculation. Obama is some kind of yeah. a Muslim. He had Muslim. So I'd like you to say a word about that as we, as we wind down this interview. Right. Uh, is Obama a Muslim? Is he a Christian? Um, uh, what, I can, I, I can say that I found absolutely no evidence that he was a Muslim. But let me just explain how, how the, the Muslim faith got into the family. Um, Onyango, the grandfather, born in 1895, was born into the traditional Luo religion. They worshipped a man called uh, Nyasir, and it was basically a traditional African um, animist religion. When the missionaries came, he did for a brief while convert to Christianity and took the name Johnson, according to Sarah Obama. Um, the uh, first missionaries that came to that part of Kenya were actually Seventh-day Adventists, and in fact most of the Obama family out in Kenya are still SDA. Then in 1914, um, Onyango was drafted into the British Army, into the King's African Rifles, and he served with the British um, in their, their Portridge Corps. And after the Second World War, uh, after the First World War, sorry, he then moved on to uh, Zanzibar, which is where for the, I think for the first time he was exposed to to uh, Islam, and he came back in about 1920 to his to his village, um, a Muslim. And I said to a lot of a lot of people, I said, look, why, you know, what was it about about Islam that appealed to Onyango? And, and there really there were t there were t two explanations. One was that. Onyango could never understand the Christian sense of compassion and he saw the world in black and white and that the simplicity of Islam um, appealed to him. Uh, the other thing that seemed to appeal to him was the fact that he could have five wives and he liked the idea. He was a very much a, woman, you know, a ladies man and people would joke and say he liked the idea of having five wives under, under Islam. Doesn't, so, it, doesn't Islam only allow four? Does Islam only allow four? I thought it was five, but actually in Kenya, I mean, there, there, there are people very liberally interpreted. But that's that's how how um, Hussein. He then took the name Hussein Onyango uh, when he converted to Islam, and he had he ended up having five wives, and he actually all of all of the wives except the president's grandmother, uh, paternal grandmother, they were all Islam, born um, Muslims. Um, Akumu, who was the president's paternal grandmother actually was born a Christian but she had to ha had to convert once she married Onyango and so that's how Islam got into the family um, Barack Obama senior the father was brought up a Muslim but once he got to once he left home in his early 20s he did as, as you say rightly he renounced any religion whether it be Christian Islam and by the time he got to Hawaii he was a confirmed atheist and as far as he was concerned, religion was was nothing more than mumbo jumbo. So there, and and as you also rightly say, his his um, the president's mother Anne was also uh, uh, an atheist. And so there wasn't really any significant religious influence in in the president's life until he went to Chicago as a community worker. And I think he then realized that the way into the communities actually was through the, the black churches, that the churches themselves were a fantastic political organization, as they so often are around, around the world. And that is when I think he started to go to church to claim that he was a Christian. It was actually hand in hand with his, his political work out in, in I think this is, quite, this is quite right and supported. Uh, Obama has a scene himself in Dreams from My Father mm -hmm. where he's talking about, or maybe it's the audacity of hope, where he says he would go from church to church yeah. organizing yeah. and the pastors and the priests would say to him, hey Obama, you know, where do you go yes. to church? And he yeah. didn't go, so he would yeah. hem and haw. Yes. Yes. And then one of his buddies said, says to him, yes. hey, you know, you better find a church. Yeah. Go check out yeah. the United Church, yeah. the Trinity Church yes. with uh, Reverend yes. Wright. Yes. So uh, that Obama's um, Christianity comes late and it's mm. very much fused with the sort of political sense yes. of social justice, yes. the involvement of the churches and the kinds of issues that Obama uh, cared about. Yes. Um, uh, let me say in closing that this is a fascinating book. It's, uh, it covers, I, I, I 
think that in America, the coverage of Obama tends to be very sanitized. And what I mean by that mm. is not that it tends to be just too positive. I think it is. Mm. But more that it doesn't dig deep into the dimensions of Obama's life, his ideas, his heritage. Uh, and you have covered in this book a, a sort of side of Obama's family history. And I, I, and I believe one very influential uh, on Obama. Uh, that I think really completes our understanding um, of, um, of, of the man who happens to be, as you say, the most uh, powerful man in the world. So, Peter Firstbrook, thank you very much. Well, thank you. The book is The Obamas, The Untold Story of an African Family. It's a fascinating read. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Thank you. That was Afterwards, Book TV Signature.